want to thank you um, for tuning in to the Institute of Global Education's uh, talk show today, IGE Talk. Uh, we we want to say a disclaimer: the thoughts and words that are spoken at the IGE talk sessions are not necessarily representative of what IGE takes on or or, or, or thinks, uh, or a staff or organization. IGE provides a forum for the community to come in and discuss pertinent issues. And we just pray that with those issues that we discuss, that some of the useful parts of what we discuss is transformed into the community and that you can use the information that we depart here for your own purposes. And you can also ask, call and ask each one of us individually, you know, to come out and maybe make a presentation. Uh, our topic well, let me back up a little bit and thank uh, uh, Chester uh, for bringing the pizza and the pop and stuff, and thank <laughs> Chuck Miller over there on the camera for being our camera person. These are very important parts of, uh, of our uh, organization, and we just want to highlight the fact that they've really contributed much to what we're doing. They do an awful lot more than that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, Chester's a board member. But... What we're, what, what we're here today, and we're here today for a very important topic, very important topic. And uh, when thinking about what we were trying to do today, to accomplish today, uh, Chuck and I went back and forth, and Chester as well, uh, on the name. Uh, the name I kind of pulled out of the angles of my brain and called it, When the Law Becomes Lawless. And... And, and, and law becomes lawless, code red or code blue. In trying to think this particular situation through, you know, with what we have that uh, is going on in Baltimore, that have went on in Ferguson and stuff like that, we see two separate uh, paths. It may be more than two paths going. We see, uh, on the one hand, we see police unions, that lockstep and lock themselves together and, and, and say nobody will tell what's going on because we're a brotherhood. That's called basically code blue. But then we're also out there we see a community that is out there and sometimes at some points in time feel that they're under attack. And when they try to express themselves peacefully Nobody pays any attention to it. So then Code Red comes. And Code Red is the fact that people have to be able to express their anger in some form. You know, you just get ulcers and you die because you can't express yourself in a productive way. So, so we have that. And so uh, we just kind of pray that the content and stuff that we're talking is beneficial and helpful to the community. So right now what I want to do is I want to go back, go around. My name is Paul Mayhew. I'm a former Kent County Commissioner. I was a clinical social worker for 32 years in this county and worked in the mental health department. So I'll go from here to Brian. Oops, sorry about that. I'm Brian Blakely, uh, Reverend Brian Blakely. I'm the uh, Outreach Pastor for First Christian Reformed Church. I'm also the Executive Director of Bates Place Ministries, an urban uh, community uh, nonprofit, and I'm I'm, a, I'm a, a candidate for Third Ward Commissioner. I'm running for Third Ward Commissioner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Mike Grand Rapids, right? Right here yeah. in Grand Rapids, yeah. Michigan. Yeah. Uh, Mike Franz, I'm an IGE <coughs> board, and uh, since you mentioned your ministry. Uh, I, I also serve with the MICA Center Beyond Prisons Working Group and uh, MoveOn.org. I've got some comments related to MoveOn's positions on this <coughs> that I'll bring you tonight. Katie? Um, I'm Katie Villar and I'm a IGE board member also. And um, I'm um, retired from teaching sociology and anthropology and writing at Grand Valley and Aquinas. And places. I'm Trayvon Garrett. Uh, I'm currently a college student and I major in sociology and nonprofit administration. Hmm. Um, my name is Mary McLeod and I, uh, 
I'm a retired attorney, but um, my passion and what I've spent most of my time doing of late is I lead groups that are learning some deeper theory of nonviolence that I think is very applicable here. So I'm a nonviolent communication group facilitator. Hi, I'm Gabriel Hapnagel. I am a college student at Aquinas and Ferris State University, and I am currently undecided. And I'm also a community member. <coughs> My name is Kim McKeon, and I'm also a board member of IGE, or Institute of Global Education, and I'm very involved in the community. Uh, my name is uh, Turkmen Gamchi. I'm from Iran. I'm the board member of the Ahraz Group. It is the Association of Human Rights of Azerbaijani People in Iran. I belong to Turkish minority uh, in Iran, so I'm very interested in uh, the uh, minority and human rights subject. Um, I, I'm Bonnie Wright. I'm a doctor of sociology working at Paris State University, and my areas of speciality are um, race, place, um, community studies, and religion, and gender and sexuality. Hi, I'm Nicholas Budimir. I teach sociology at Muskegon Community College. My name is Michael Scruggs. I'm chairman of the Kent County Black Caucus, and I'm a past board, executive board member of the Kent County Department of Human Services. My name is Dr. Rick Rosselli. I'm a metaphysical, quantum physics, a spiritual aspect of the spirit, mind, and body of each and every person that I had contact with. I also have a nonprofit organization, a new one, and it's newworldexpansion.com. And uh, I'm <coughs> in Grand Rapids, been here a year, and I'm here to bring together integration in regards to society in the Grand Rapids area in Western Michigan. I'm Chester Lowe. I'm a board member with IGE, producer of the show here. Also, I am also a member with the Micah Center, and I work with the Criminal Justice Chaplaincy as a mentor. And, it, and it's back to me at this point, and you know, we got a real big group, so the thing that we're going to have to do is be respectful of each other's conversations, and uh, so I'll read a little clip to kick this off. You know, we have, uh, I have a... Uh, I said you, I have a, a law that was created in 2002 that's really applicable for today. I sent that out to the group, and I wanted you to read it. It's called, uh, we call it Logan's Law. And, and, and under what happened here is in 2002, there was a group of African-American citizens uh, on the corner of Union and Bates that were sitting in a car listening to music and the police came which they felt that they were tipped off by some lady in the community which they didn't uh, know anything about and, and 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 the lady said there was some people over here sitting in the car doing something illegal so when the cop when the police officers got to the car at that particular corner, there was nobody doing anything illegal. They didn't see any illegal activity. But they put the headlights on and proceeded to arrest the uh, uh, youth that was in the car, you know, for I don't really know, you know. Ultimately they ended up getting charged of resisting and opposing, were taken out of the car forcefully and taken to Kent County Jail. And this particular situation uh, went to Judge Logan in district court to decide. <clears throat> Judge Logan <clears throat> sided with the youth uh, in this particular case because <clears throat> the youth were just sitting in the car and there was nothing illegal going on. There was nothing illegal going on when they were approached. and. Judge Logan at that particular time felt that they shouldn't have been arrested and taken to, uh, to Kent County Jail. So he sided with the 
uh, sided with the officer. Now that's rare, but it's it, it's a truism. You know, things. This is what should happen, and this is what's not happening uh, today in a lot of cases. So anyway, the long and the short of it is, I bring this up because at that time the prosecutor filed an appeal saying, hey, we can't, we've got to sustain this. We, we can't allow this to happen. So he, the prosecutor appealed uh, the, Logan's decision that the boys were not doing anything wrong. And the long and the short of it is the prosecutor, the judge, the chief judge at that particular time, which I think was Judge Booth, overruled the prosecutor, which which sets a precedent, and that's why I'm bringing this up, because it sets a precedent in this community that African-American boys can sit in cars and listen to music without being arrested by the police. Now, I'm, that shouldn't have to be on the books, but it is on the books. In that particular, in, in, it's not in the fashion I'm telling it. You know, obviously I'm paraphrasing because I get a little heated, but still, <laughs> that's what happens. So... So now we have a situation in our community that uh, that happens uh, that African American kids and people in the poor areas, Hispanics and stuff, can walk in the they do walk in the community, but they are costed time after time after time. You know, well, you're walking around the street with your pants hanging down or something like that, and when they begin an interaction, then all of a sudden there's a rule broken. A law violation, and then they there's the arrest warrant that this guy's in. So I just bring that up as as the initial, so that we can talk about. Can this I give initial. you a more recent example? Yeah, yeah. This just happened uh, last week, I believe, and the woman who was arrested will be uh, arraigned in court Monday at eight thirty, and there's going to be a motion that the charges be dismissed. But what happened was that. <clears throat> Actually, I know more about it than what the police did because they came late, arrested the wrong person, and left without <coughs> investigating. Okay, but uh, a 13-year-old girl, by her father's behest, was being forced to attack an 11-year-old girl uh, for whatever reasons I don't know. But two crowds formed, about 40 people on each side, mostly women, and there were some peacekeepers involved. Uh, who kind of waded in and said, hey, you know, take it easy, you know. And in the midst of the melee that followed, and the police were called but didn't show, uh, one of them had a, we call it a taser, okay. And, and she had it and was defending herself, and it was used against her. She was on the ground. Uh, this woman stepped in and started talking to the crowd, you know, to calm them down. And about this time, the police showed and they told her, go, go get in the squad car. And then they later arrested her for, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> resisting arrest or whatever, being unruly, whatever. Uh, I mean, they told her to shut up, and she didn't, okay? I mean, they wanted that power, you know, we're here, shut up, you know. And, and they left with her and never investigated. There were two tasers involved which are both illegal. There were things that were going on that could have resulted in charges, but they were more interested in the, in the woman who was, who was actually acting as a peacekeeper. So, I mean, I think this piggybacks on to what you're talking about here. It, it does. There's and a presumption here. It, it's a presumption here that anybody that's there, that's helping, you know, that you're causing trouble, you know, I think that if they would have took the extra step and, and, and talked to some of the people that was there on the scene, they would have found out that this was a, but they wouldn't do that because it's, a, it's the assumption that I have power and authority and I must uh, make my power and authority work. So these are examples of when law becomes lawless, you know, cold red or cold blue. And in terms of cold red, cold blue, I'm going to go to this young lady over here and then I'm going to go over there. Go okay. Uh, so uh, it's just that type of presumption. So Next anyway. one is the poor that's what happened with Eric Garner. He was trying to start stop a fight. Who's that? The man who was choked to death in New York. Oh, yeah. He was trying to start stop oh, a yeah. fight. Oh, yeah. He was going. 
Yeah. No, he was being filmed. He was being filmed, and they filmed him, and he was choked to death on film. But the, brought the police there in the first place as he was stopping the fight. Mm. But they did arrest the man who was doing the filming. The filming, right, yeah. right, right. It, you know, just what you're saying, Paul. This idea that um, they don't have to be, they don't have to investigate very much, and they don't have to be very careful, and that their their actions are not going to be scrutinized, and yet the citizens who pay their salaries and are supposed to be protected by them, their actions, there's an inference from sitting in a car that you're doing something you shouldn't be done, doing. Or if you're standing in front of a crowd, there's an inference you shouldn't. And it's, I wanted to say, mention Matt Tybee came and spoke about his new, what's his book called, The Divide? But it's, the subject of the book is that um, if you are, if you are a white collar criminal, if you, um, if millions of people's retirement income disappears through your actions, you will not be, you'll never see a day in jail. But if you um, commit some minor infraction on the street and you are not um, wealthy and in the right place, you'll see jail time and it'll affect your family and it'll affect your ability to work again. And um, that there's just a huge disparity. That is a huge disparity in that, you know, if we, if we think here recently, we talk about five major banks that have just been fined five billion dollars uh, for manipulating the currency market. Now that just happened. Five major banks. City no bank, criminal go, charges. No, and, and no, criminal, no criminal, charges. criminal charges, even though the banks collectively are felons. But no criminal charges against any individual. No individual goes to jail. So, but, you know, it's cold red, cold blue. You know, here's a situation. Let me go back to the police situation, especially if we related to Baltimore. <clears throat> here's a here's a person that has uh, that was not doing anything, you know, and and basically get arrested for nothing and taken to jail. Now we have situations like that that happen here, but here you, you the people in Baltimore was trying to do peaceful protest as a result of what they felt was a a wrong doing. The peaceful protest didn't work because the media, what media does is they give you a media blackout. And so when you want to get your word out into the community about this is wrong, well, the media discerns that, hey, I'm not putting it out there. You know, I'm, I'm not going to be the troublemaker, which, which helps to set off a community that says we need our word out. But then it forces them to go to do the crazy stuff. Well, I'm going to digress and let you guys... Yeah, uh, the thing that seems to tie a lot of these stories together is um, the charge of resisting arrest. And there doesn't have to be much evidence for that. In fact, uh, like with Eric Gardner, they called him a person who's resisting arrest. He had asthma and he was flailing about because he was dying. And that was considered resisting arrest. So... Although, I mean, Twitching it, your arms. He was, kind of, he was kind of saying, I don't want to... I mean, he was a man who had been arrested many, many, many times. Mm -hmm. And he, they finally decided that they were going to arrest him on this really, what I think most people in the United States would call a nothing charge, selling mm -hmm. loose cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And he was, if you watch the video, he was kind of sick of the harassment, and he says... I'm sick of the harassment, and he does this, and he says, "No, you're he not no doing this." He, he didn't right touch there. anyone. He stood but then right they, there. He didn't resist. They, whatever interpreted his saying, "I don't want to be arrested," and ba basically, I mean, you could be sympathetic and say they were really harassing him, and he was in a way fed up from years of uh, interactions with the criminal justice system, and it was, you know, the last sort of the last straw for him. I don't want to be arrested, and out of the blue, you watch the video, basically 15 officers come out of the screen and pull the man down, and within a few minutes, so that uh, he, he but is But that's my he point, is, is resisting arrest is just something you can just say, I don't want to be arrested, and it's a mm -hmm. felony crime, 
I no, did. no, no. It, and you end up dead. And you end up dead, or even worse. Right. That's what I did. Which is yeah. the sick arrest, isn't it? I mean. Yeah. So, so the point is, resisting arrest is something that can be used against you, and it's one of the things they use against people in plea mm -hmm. bargaining. So if they don't get you, they don't have enough evidence for you to be convicted of a specific crime, then they say, well, you better cop to this resisting mm -hmm. arrest charge, you know. And, and so it becomes this pressure thing with hardly any proof, and all it takes is two officers to say, yeah, that person resisted arrest. And that's the end of it. Cold blue. Yeah, that's, that's cold blue. That's no. cold blue. But then what happens is cold red. Cold red is, okay, here I'm trying to get my, I'm sick of being arrested for nothing. So now I go to the media, the media portrays me as an ogre. Mm -hmm. The media portrays me as 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 a real criminal. The first thing they do is, oh, this guy was uh, he got caught with dope in his pocket forty years ago. So now the media takes what has happened to this person's past and blows it up to make the public feel that he's not worthy of of us to support. Paul, if I could very quickly, there uh, I believe it was today. So the Monday, the, uh, um, Wednesday the 20, 21st, uh, Charles, Charles Blow wrote a, um, wrote a column that compared the media's treatment of uh, Ferguson, of the protests and whatever you want to call them, urban disturbances, riots in Ferguson and in Baltimore, to the coverage of <coughs> the uh, outlaw biker gang shooting and killing of eight or nine people in Waco, Texas. Mm -hmm. So uh, the uh, news media, including President Obama, called the protesters and rioters in uh, Ferguson and in Baltimore thugs. Even Correct. President Obama says that. But the news media calls the actual killers, actual killers in Waco, Texas, outlaw biker gangs. A much more... <laughs> I mean, yeah, is, I, I mean, it sounds, it, it's moderate, moderate compared to yeah. the... It's actually yeah. what they so, are, an outlaw yeah. biker gang is a yeah, criminal it, it's, organization. It's so sort it's of just a saying, descriptive you're a criminal term. organization. So, so basically, Charles Blow uh, in the New York Times uh, made a parallel to say, you know, calling protesters who end up, you know, in slightly more violent circumstances, when you call them thugs, it's a racialized, mm -hmm. uh, almost a racialized epithet. And whereas, gendered. I've never heard of a woman called a thug. Yeah, no women get called thugs. So basically, by media and even President Obama calling uh, protesters in Ferguson and in Baltimore thugs, it's almost like uh, a, a, a mischaracterization mm -hmm. of black males. Yeah, it's, it's I'm definitely. Gonna ask, I'm going to ask yeah. if there's ever any white male ever called a thug. That's a great question. Only in there in the mafia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. It's from a. There, there are some Indian people that are from the country of India. Mm -hmm. I mean, the word. That's, that's where, where the word comes. Tuggy, oh, really? I guess. Oh, I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. 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 And, but it has come to be, like um, you know, thugs, and it's used internationally <laughs> now as, you know, bad guys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Profiling has <clears> always existed. But it's been propagated much more in certain communities, mm -hmm. in certain races, mm -hmm. and, and uh, these yeah. occurrences that are taking place. There's a positive and negative thing, negative thing going on here. One is the negative is that there is a lot of abuse, and uh, and when there is that kind of abuse, taking power and using it as real freedom to do what you want. Um, it's really a state of fear. The reaction is because society as a whole, America, does not want that. Right? Because uh, of a lot of circumstances regarding manipulation and control, speaking about the government right on down to the police force, there's a lot of manipulation and control. It's getting stronger, there's more communication, it's easier to see. And, but that is the beginning of birth pains. That is the beginning of people saying, no, we've had enough. And I'm not talking just one race, I'm talking all races. 
people are joining more together, which is a good thing. But reacting to violence is not the answer, because violence will only bring more violence. <coughs> I question, I question uh, America on that really? context, too, because one thing that I've seen uh, that was kind of going viral was that um, when uh, and uh, people connect this, so one of the Twin Towers uh, got uh, hit by, um, uh, what's the guy's name? Um, Bin Laden. Bin Laden. Yeah, Bin yeah. Laden. Uh, first thing America did was like, we about to go to war. And so yeah. that's violence on violence. But yet, when someone comes, it's like they attack our community. They don't want. They want to preach to us this whole peaceful protest thing. <laughs> but we're not able to use violence inside of our own uh, country. So for us, a white cop killing a black man is the same thing like a terrorist attack to us. It's like snap, you're trying to kill us off. Uh, so I feel like America's like this one-way street where if someone else outside this country hit us, oh, best believe we're going to shoot them. But if we shoot someone, uh, shoot another culture inside of our country, just please uh, uh, protest in a peaceful way. And I'm not saying peaceful is not, I mean, I'm not saying um, rioting is an answer. I definitely agree with the peace. But I feel like that we go down this one-way street and we begin to be so closed-minded when we ask the question, mm -hmm. why are they doing this in violence? You know why they're doing this in violence. Because love is so strong that sometimes we just don't know how to act. And when you love so much, so much, I believe you can show uh, well, all I that did, powerful love and anger. I did, not come, I did not come forth with the positive side of this. Okay. The negative side of this is that they're trained a certain way, they're trained more forceful now than ever, probably ever before. Mm -hmm. And and that is not that is not helpful for society mm -hmm. uh, in the police department. And uh, and what happens is um, police officers, and I said this before, used to be called peace officers. Okay. For their benefit the community. Really? Mm -hmm. But a lot of that has changed. The fear factor has really risen. Mm -hmm. So that even the training is different now. But so if we think my, of on my positive side of that, on my positive side of it is that <clears throat> it's bringing change. Mm -hmm. It's bringing a lot of change because w there's only one thing eternal, and that's love. And when you start looking at, at situations and people start getting together and saying loving one another, the well-being of me and the well-being of you, and that is a tsunami of love. It's coming, and that is the positive side. But there is going to be a lot of turmoil that, like we are seeing and experiencing. The answer is not violence. The answer is to be aware, communicate, connect, and say, yes, there's better, because the solution is always in the problem. Mm -hmm. All right? And the, pro and the solution is love. As we unite, as we communicate together, we will change things. Okay, let me go to this young lady, Mike. I would like to say, first of all, that the people in Baltimore and in Ferguson weren't violent. No one died. Okay? It was the police who were violent, number one. Number two, the problem with communities resisting authority with violence is that the authority has so much more violence to give back. And I hate to see communities destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the United States' actions by attacking other countries. And yeah, that's what's happened. But what's happened is by attacking other countries, all that the country of the United States has done is created bigger and badder enemies. Because mm -hmm. whenever there's violence, there's a dialectic. Yeah. And so that means the other group gives violence back, and you can't stop violence with violence. Mm -hmm. You just make it worse. Yeah. But mm -hmm. I have to, again, end with emphasizing the people in Baltimore and Ferguson were not violent. I mean, property is, is nothing in comparison to human life. Yeah. I, I don't okay. like the way the press made it seem as if they were let's, 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 let's And probably the this, um, these little, I, they, I mean, if you watch the, they, they looked like riots and looting, yeah. But we do know that what happens when people act in groups, we do know people get carried away. Yeah. Um, so uh, the the insinuation that the, the 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 burning of the CVS that wasn't the protest M most likely that was an accidental um, uh, an accidental thing that happens when people who are upset mm -hmm. greatly impassioned about an issue and this weird social order of police of threat of somebody is dead. When passions run high, 
it was I, I these were probably disagree accidents. with part of what let, you let, say. Let me go to Mike here. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if any of you saw Bill Maher Friday night on HBO. Of course yeah. not. That's <laughs> for rich white people. <laughs> uh, he had a black activist from Baltimore, and I forget his name, but he had a, he was a large man with an auspicious Killer Mike. name. Killer Mike. Killer Mike. Killer Mike. Killer Mike. Yeah, look at him, Bill Maher. Yeah. yeah I saw that. Okay. Uh, he said, when when the people, the thugs or whatever, attacked CVS Pharmacy, okay, they had motives. They they did it intentionally with motivation. But he says, but the media covered that, and they did not cover the uh, other blacks who were protecting the other businesses in the community, saying, don't riot here, don't riot here. The peacemakers were out in force. They never covered that. Mm -hmm. But it was okay, CVS, and he gave the reasons. He said, well, CVS Pharmacy uh, doesn't hire from the community because they're afraid they're going to steal and do this and that. Mm -hmm. He said, they, they charge too much money. He gave another reason, I forget. But, you know, CVS Pharmacy was, was definitely a target uh, in, the, in the eyes of the people that wanted to make trouble anyway. Mm -hmm. but, but the point is the media didn't cover the other thing. They covered what they wanted to cover. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, well, we, we have to uh, first look at the history of, of this country, the decadency of this country. It, how do we get here? When we look at history, this country was built on capitalism, and it was protected by the Constitution, the legalities. This country made its money off slavery. The laws was, was trying to be understood by all because they were looking at the spirit of the law compared to the letter of the law. And when you look at Lincoln and the Emancipation Proclamation, we moved on through all those laws that, that where African American came from and, and, and we started getting rights and, and we started getting education. But what happened was, in our legal system, there was a law for white folks and a law for black folks. So there was a double standard in our legal system, in, in law enforcement, and we just was not treated right. Institutions. In, in all the institutions. So, so here we have a, a, a young man that get in trouble, uh, uh, that was white, that would call his parents. But it was a black guy, a black young man get in trouble, then he go to juvenile. What had happened, we, 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 moved, from, we moved from there with the, the Voting Rights and Civil Rights Act. Uh, uh, we, we, we was able to, to get some jobs, and, and, and they might not pay much, but we was able to participate more in this society. But the legal system stopped us from moving so far. We had the unions that was trying to help us and get us right because we were working in, in poor conditions. But then we had Reagan that came with the war on drugs. A different caste system. And we went from slavery to Jim Crow, then a different caste system. And the caste system started locking black folks up for, for very little reason, practically none at all. You know, you, 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 you catch a white guy with $100 worth of cocaine, you know, he might do six months probation, and when he's a black guy, getting four, five years. Yeah. So we look at now that our prison system mm -hmm. is just full of black men, and they've been like that for years. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about the police and their interaction with the black man, he already know that, that he is used as chattel. He's part of the capitalist system. Now, being a part of that uh, a capitalist system means that there's an assault not only against the African-American male, but against the African-American child, against the African-American family dynamic. What has been happening for the last 50 years? They take the male, black male out the house, out the home, by locking him up in prison, mm -hmm. institutionalizing him. Mm -hmm. Then they just leave the black woman trying to take care her children. Then they taken the child out the home for very little reason at all, put them in foster care, where not only put them in foster care, put them in other counties with strangers, institutionalized, and most of individuals that's in in foster care end up in the criminal justice system. Eighty-five percent. Mm -hmm. Okay. 85%. So 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 now so now you have companies like GEO. 
and Correctional Corp. Uh, 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 Correctional Corporation. Of Co yeah, she said Correctional Corporation of America is on Wall Street. Some of you all yeah. got 401ks and invested in these companies. They got on two hundred and some prisons around the world, girl. You know, saying to the state of Michigan, we'll run your prison for you. Okay. So now the state, our government, we in a contract with them, that is they, they say, well, hey, we got a contract that you're gonna guarantee us ninety percent. So how are they gonna fill up these prisons? So they say to the judge, they say to the, to the chief police, so the chief police say to his officer, hey, you gotta make your quota. So here we go to jail for little nothing. We go to jail, and we have no poor representation because they just throw a lawyer at the last minute. And we go before a jury trial, and then African Americans on juries. Yeah. Very you know, you see. Very, very so, so the whole system. I, I would just love to have a, a contract selling toilet paper. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go to this young man here. Yeah. Um, He's a young guy just coming into this social work. Yeah. Uh, I love how you touched on um, history, and I think one thing that America fell in and people fell in in general is um, leave it, leaving it at this negative concept. Yes, slavery was bad, but we forget to empower our young African-American youth saying that, did you not know Harriet Tubman was illiterate and she overcame illiterate systems? So people that was smart, that knew their way around this whole thing, and she followed a star in her conscience and was able to get free and free many of slaves. So I feel like that we lack the empowerment of our African American community. And for me, I'm thankful I came to slaves. I feel like I came from a line, uh, a line of geniuses, someone who made up this uh, country and planned on to go it their way, and yet this other group of slaves took it all over that didn't have no type of education, no type of background or anything like that. So I think one thing that we lack in like community and in schools is not empowering the kids. We can say, oh, slavery was this, and then leave it at that. Let me pick it back on that. Let me, some this let, very let, me, let me get this here. You know, I, we have to understand that when they went to Africa, when Africa, the Africans that helped to uh, take the slave, mm -hmm. they were taking the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. The Africans that helped, the, you know, you had the, the, the Muslim African yep. mm -hmm. that helped to enslave the African. Mm -hmm. They were taking the cream of the crop. So it wasn't that these people were not educated per se. Okay. They just didn't know the language and mm -hmm. couldn't navigate the language here in America. But then they were taking, they were taking some pretty high-level people and putting them on those boats. And, and the travesty is that we have 10... Million people that jumped into the Atlantic. Right. Ten million Africans. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we celebrate the Holocaust, and God bless, we don't need another Holocaust. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> our Holocaust is ten million people that jumped into the Atlantic and says, I'm not going. Right. Young lady right there. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, uh, I want to insist on the identity uh, that I... Uh, cover all these uh, under the identity. So I'm uh, uh, from the Middle East area, so over there people, uh, maybe it is hard to uh, to notice that who belong to which race because yeah. uh, it's not the identity and race is not uh, something to be uh, noticed on the appearance. Okay. But uh, over there, me as a uh, as a person who belong to Turkish minority in Iran, uh, we have to deal with uh, Persian racism. Because you know uh, the, the the brotherhood, as you explained, uh, you know they they uh, they want to assimilate uh, the people who belong to other culture. Maybe maybe the appearance are same, and it is not uh, be um, it is not something to, something to be noticed. So they said that no, you are you are you are not uh, uh, this. I mean, you are not under the discrimination. You mm -hmm. but. But when the, they, they do not discriminate when we assimilate in the culture and we, uh, uh, and we, uh, we, we live all over culture, language, we do, uh, and, uh, because you know, maybe the 40% of the uh, country population are belong to you know, not uh, Persian uh, uh, culture and Persian language. 
So they became illiterate with their mother language, and they had to assimilate in this culture, and they disconnected from the uh, from their past, from the future, and also you know that uh, that area which is uh, from the government. Uh, uh, you know, the government uh, always scared that this area may want to be separate from the country, so they have, to, they, they leave those area undeveloped and, you know, make them, you know, to live in uh, poor, uh, you know, with, uh, to deal with um, um, uh, poverty. As we speak, we have a law, we have House Bill 4607 and 4406 and 4407. Those are House Bills to fix the jury selection process. If you go to my uh, uh, Facebook page, you will see those House Bills and names of representatives that we should call. We should leave out of here with an action plan to go and look <coughs> up House Bills 4406 and 4407 and ask, our, ask you, the people in the audience and as well as us here, to make phone calls to your legislators telling we need those bills passed. The jury selection process throughout this whole country is impaired. The whole jury, so if you have a deliberate impairment of a jury selection process. You have a <coughs> judge that will say to the community that it doesn't matter whether you have race on the jury selection process or not. When you know that's wrong, because your folk ways and more ways are different than my folk ways and more ways. Well, see, excuse me if I may, mm -hmm. I'm going to say the uh, matter of the fact is that we're in West Michigan here. There's a difference in West Michigan and East Michigan. Mm -hmm. West Michigan will be what we call plainly pure white in its way of functioning and thinking. And if people don't think along that little way, then they're abnormal or they're out of line and they're ready to be incarcerated for even walking down the street if they don't think and act along that way. That's an action. Also, the other factor to all this is that skin color. Mm -hmm. Skin color, the darker you are, the more in, uh, more you'll be interrogated or incarcerated. Mm -hmm. You can be black, while at the same time, that is African American, while at the same time, you can be light complexed. And if you're light complexed, you have less of harassment or should say, being stopped by the police. Trust me, there's a, I've seen it. She, 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 made, she, made, she made a point. Yeah, that's, that's why, that's why I bring it to your attention. Uh, if, if, if I will, she made a point 
that speaks you. You talked about the, the blackout, and you you talked about assimilation, uh, and and uh, when you talk about assimilation, well, we have our media protects the government, yeah, and and on only limited information that, that we receive that feeds in the system that while we in the predicament as the African American community, good example of that. I talk to people every day. They don't. The, the the Michigan Supreme Court, November 2014, said that the state of Michigan have a right to give an education, but not a quality one. We should be challenging that. Right. You can give me an education, but not a quality one. And using my taxpayer dollars. And using my taxpayer dollars. Well, here's another thing. Here's another thing. They said, well, the black don't want to work and this and that. No, we don't want to work for that little money you got us doing. <laughs> The, a report just came out the other day that said that the employment rate was five point something percent. We had average with the, with the United States, average the whole country, right? whole country. These are entry level jobs, right? Right. That they pay minimal wage. Yeah. They're worse than entry level. How am I take care of myself and my family? Right. I'm living from check to check. Yeah. You know, they're worse than entry level jobs because they're. Temp service job. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Let me get this lady yeah. right here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I want to touch on what you said about identity, and I want to touch on what you said about about history and cap in capitalism. First of all, you're right. One of the things that I think Amer America, as much as we are a rich country and we have a lot of good things, we many times have been taught to take people's identity. That is part of capitalism. We did it to the American Indians. We did it to the African Americans. We enforce I, our ideology upon them as our ideology, capitalism, is right and capitalism is the only path. We made the, Af we made the American Indians go to school. You know, and mm -hmm. we may, and we, and we taught, and they were not. They, we robbed them. They, they had to learn how to speak English. They couldn't learn keep their own language. And we continue to do this in the day. Now, how do you think right now when we go on over to the Arab countries? We take our our ideology is we're the right ideology, mm -hmm. and we're not the we're not the only path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're supposed to be the best crap. Mm -hmm. yeah. But my point is, is that I guess I, you know I'm 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 trying I'm 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 um, struggling as I say this. What I'm saying is, is that has been passed down, and that's why in our institutions, because it's it, it comes from our government, it's all passed down to every institution, whether it be the police force, whether it be the school system. And I hate to say this, and I don't mean to it to offend you, but it even happens in our churches. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. oh I'm, I'm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he can speak to that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, He's got a front row. I want to make. He's got a front row. In fact, in fact, Christianity these days gets a bad rap, and the only reason they get a bad rap is because it is our institutions. It's Jesus Christ gets a bad rap because of the institutions. Yeah. But I have power. Well, hold on, hold on. Give me a second. Wait, slow. I'm, I'm gonna get back to you. We're gonna have to begin to hone down, wrap up, because we're just about five minutes to eight. Go ahead. Uh, the the, uh, the system we have in America and the government and everything. We have to remember one thing there, and that one thing is that we put them in the power, which says the definition of that is that we can actually turn that around and take it the power back. We really can do this. But that's it's where the violence statement. that's where the violence is coming Wait, from because but, but the violence isn't the answer. I know it isn't, but and that is where it's coming from, I understand that. But we do have as we unite and as we come together in integration and we come from the aspect of the well being of each other and unite, we can change the government. Mm -hmm. I'm serious. Mm -hmm. yep. We can change the government. Because the system does not work. Actually, it never did work that good. And we have the opportunity to change it. Mm -hmm. We're in a day of a time, and the black community, the, the uh, okay, Indian gonna, community, and all of it, okay. we have opportunity here. We have much opportunity. And all that 
negativism we see is is a is for us to focus and say we can change this if we really want. We're gonna have to keep the comments down to like 45, 30 to forty five seconds because we're winding down. <laughs> okay. So hopefully you don't mind that. I go to this young lady and this young lady who hasn't spoken, and then Mike, and then you, and then you. Okay. Hopefully y'all can remember what I said. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I wanted to, uh, you know, this is not that different from what you're saying, but um, one of the names that gets bandied about when we see the CVS burning is, you know, why can't these people be nonviolent the way Martin Luther King was? And I want to say that... Um, our understanding of what nonviolence is is not is not what Martin Luther King. It's very superficial compared to what Martin Luther King was doing. What Martin Luther King was doing, he was saying that these prejudices, the word thugs, these these thoughts, and these things are just as violent, if not more so, than burning the CVS, than um, throwing the brick. That, that as long as we have the judgments of each other in our minds, we, that violence will out. And, and so the people, in order to connect with each other and to overcome violence, and I think this leads back to what you're saying, we have to deal with the, with the violence in our minds and in our judgments and not worry, about, not worry so much about the symptoms of it. Okay. This young lady here? Um, I, I, I've enjoyed um, learning from what everyone's been saying so far. Um, I'm not the most experienced with these topics, and um, one of my friends pointed out uh, that even though People ask what Martin Luther King would have done. You know, it's true that he was killed, so we can't know. And I thought that was really powerful. And she said it a lot better than I did. But, okay. I, I know this is out of order. Is I have finished? one line by Martin Luther King that I think does say what. Are, are you is. finished? No. Go no, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I, I just get really overwhelmed by like taking in everything from everyone um, and I just find you know the videos that I see on the internet that I watched before I came here and over the past couple months and years really shocking um, people getting um, killed wrongfully and finding out about it in secret it's like worse than any um, creepy sci-fi movie or it's worse than 1984, like, just, yeah, and just thinking about all of it together is interesting and horrifying. Um, yeah, and I definitely don't like the use of the word thug. Uh, one of my English teachers um, felt that it was necessary to talk about how um, people were thugs or the people in Baltimore were thugs, and I just, I was totally turned off. I probably should have said something, but, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, go ahead, Mike. I have two things, very quick, too. Yeah, um, we were wrapping down in You're saying there are some things spots. we can do. Uh, I just went to the moveon.org site today and signed a petition that calls for the, our Justice Department to finally take samples of all of the police actions against black and brown people and actually get the statistics down and investigate. Now that's a good petition. You want to make a difference? Go to moveon.org, sign the petition, okay? And it's because the media doesn't cover good news, um, <clears throat> you're probably not aware that Detroit Free Press published it, but our governor came out uh, last, uh, this Monday with a 12-page document on prison reform in the state of Michigan, and they were taking up all of the issues that we have been asking them to look at, uh, presumptive parole and all of these things. The governor's got it right. And he's not talking about bringing in private institutions to, to, to you know, incarcerate people. He's talking in enlightened ways about what to do 
you know, to get people out of prison and to get them back get, uh, assimilated into normal I life. Have a, I have an appointment this next week with uh, AIDS, oh, Governor Snyder. I have an appointment with him, a two-hour meeting you want to talk with them, and, and, and I am talking in regards to some of these issues. Okay. But he has a great heart to help this. Yes, he's let got me, the right ideas. Let me go to Mike. Okay, it, it, 30, it, 30 seconds. It, it, it's great that we're all getting together. If we, if we want to make a difference, if we want to have a solution to our <clears> many <throat> problems, we can get there. We can get there by messaging. We understand that the media have not been treating us right. But we can get them to treat us right because we can get to their advertiser that advertise on them and say, hey, this is our issue. We want you to start being fair. And it's there. We just boycott them. But we need to do it together. So as we go forward, let's think about that as we come together. You know, get our positions, come to them. If they don't treat us right, then we, 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 we boycott those people because that's their money. And, and, and that's the only thing that they look at. And, and this is a great group to begin a firestorm. I mean, just don't think because you're small in number, you're a big number here, but just don't think because we're small in number that we cannot create a firestorm. I'm a, I remember as an ACORN organizer, people said that you guys couldn't change the world. But 20 years ago, we set in motion a black president at the Moscone Center in uh, New York. I was there. We set in direction. We opened up the democratic process with ACORN. That's why ACORN got kicked out of the governmental process. Sure. Because we set a process in direction 20, uh, 30 years ago that said we wanted a black president. Jesse Jackson was our first person that used that test model. And, and, and he doesn't get the credit that he deserved, but he was that first person that we used as a test model. And now we have Barack Obama. But we set that up 30 years ago at the Moscone Center. So you can make a difference. You just got to believe that you can. Somebody else, uh, there you yeah. go. Yeah, I, I, two, it, wrap it up. I have two points. The first one is that we talked about assimilation and identity. And I don't want people to leave out of here thinking that, you know, if only you assimilate, it's going to all be good. It's not been the move in the United States. The move has been to not assimilate, but then to blame people because they aren't assimilated. So put, put that there. So you're really not allowed. Then number two, I'd like to say that although I, I'm fully supportive of boycotts and fighting the system, I think that it's limited. I, go ahead, I'll join you and keep doing it. I think that we kind of need to build our own thing because the real power comes from an alternative to this. We cannot take capitalism down with weapons. We can't not buy their stuff. That's my opinion. I think that we can think of alternative ways of doing things and try to leave out as much of those people as possible. Building our own alternative energy, you can get your own energy sources set up with solar power and these other types of things. You can make your own things. I, I know it sounds far-fetched, but I just think that we got to get away from them. That's it. Right there. Well, I, I guess I have two real quick things. Um, the, the consciousness of the United States should be broadened and awakened to the sort of uh, mass criminalization, especially of the black body. Why do people, uh, especially law enforcement officers and civilians, why do they see specifically African American males as a threat? Mm -hmm. You see Trayvon Martin, etc. Et uh, the American consciousness has to be opened up on that. And uh, number two, uh, I think the major cause of a lot of the uh, arrests and over incarceration. We need sentencing reform. We did not have mass incarceration before the 1980s, before the war on drugs. Post 1980s, with vastly expanded sentences, bad sentences, we had it. So, thank you it. all. One thing we get one one thing from Chester. Yeah, I wanted to just uh, say uh, the um, the thing he was talking about, yeah. about mass incarceration. Uh, being starting in the 80s, that was during the uh, Reagan administration, and that was called the New Jim Crow. I mean, that's what his title is now, the New Jim Crow. It's a good book. That's, yeah, new, uh, a book by yeah. Michelle Alexander, who was an attorney 
at the uh, Ohio State University who wrote that book. Professor. Professor. Okay. Thank and you. I want to say thank you. One final, final. I haven't been here much, but over at the Micah Center, a very similar discussion was taking place, and we should just join together. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Final, final, and we're closed. And thank you, everybody, for contributing. Okay. Thank you.